agenda is set. Hello, everyone. I'm Brent Goff in Berlin. Today on the show, a political plan to once and for all consign the euro to the history books. And the idea is made in Germany. That and more today. It's time to talk. Japan and the lessons of Fukushima. Two years ago, a tsunami triggered a meltdown at the nuclear power plant. The cleanup is never ending, and yet Japan has not sworn off nuclear power. Today, we ask why. Well, forget about Greece, Italy, and Spain. They most likely will not be home to the demise of the euro. The currency's death could very well come from Germany. For years, Germany's political leaders have defended the common European currency. Legal challenges against the euro have also failed. But the German voter could finally kill the euro thanks to a homegrown political party. And a founding member of that party is on the show today. And speaking of the things that voters can do, Kenyans have just elected a new president who is also going to trial accused of orchestrating mass murder. Uhuru Kenyatta is now both president and defendant. His victory over Raila Odingo should bring the country political peace, but having a president to face the International Criminal Court could pit Kenya against the West. Well, I've invited three people today to talk, argue, and pry apart these headlines. My first guest just returned from Kenya, where she watched firsthand how the election was conducted. I'm happy to welcome to the show a, a colleague of mine, Maya Brown. She was, uh, or she is, DW special correspondent to Kenya for the elections. Uh, Maya, you just got back. I, I want to talk about um, what you experienced, what you saw in Kenya in just a moment. But first, um, Kenyans elected a president who is accused of mass murder at the ICC. What are the Kenyans telling the world with this decision? Well, one thing, of course, they are telling is that they want to make their own political decisions and not be told by somebody else who to elect. But another important message they're giving today and that's been forgotten is that they can have a peaceful election. That is very important. Yeah, we're going to talk about that. Peace as well as national sovereignty, both coming up a little bit later on. My second guest is a founding member of the Alternative for Germany, a group that plans to become a political party in just a few weeks and then begin fighting to dismantle the euro as we know it. So we've got the fighter here with us today. I'm happy to welcome to the show Frauke Petri. She's with one of the founders of Alternative for Germany. Frauke, Germans are not protesting in masses. The economy here is very resilient. It's been resilient in the financial crisis and in the euro crisis. And unemployment here remains low. Who in the world is going to vote for you? We reckon there's a quite a big majority of Germans that are willing to vote for a new party because um, we asked for um, their opinions about the euro. And if you, for example, look at the focus, um, more than 97% said they could well imagine a currency that would not be the euro anymore. All right, well, we're going to talk about the possibility of maybe going back to the German mark. We'll talk about that in just a second. And my next guest says that the Japanese have watched with fascination at how Germany, following the Fukushima accident, decided to end its use of nuclear power once and for all. I'm happy to welcome to the show Alexandra Sakiti. She is a leading authority on Japanese politics and economics here in Germany. She's with one of the leading think tanks, the German Institute for International and Security Affairs. Alexandra, glad you can make time to join us today. Why have it the Japanese taken bigger steps following Fukushima? Well, in my view, it's not just that Japan had a very high dependence on nuclear energy prior to the disaster, but more importantly, I think it's uh, vested interests and uh, the pro-nuclear lobby that is um, preventing Japan from taking bigger steps in Japan. Yeah, the power of, of the energy lobby there. We're going to pick up on that, too, in just a moment. And, you know, immediately following the Fukushima meltdowns, Japan's power companies took all nuclear reactors offline. Now, work on three new reactors under construction was halted. But since then, Japan has gone through three prime ministers, each one cautiously more positive about nuclear power than his predecessor. And authorities recently gave the green light for construction to resume on a new reactor. There were no large public protests about that. Japan 
in 2013 feels strangely different from the Japan of March 2011. A memorial service in Japan for the victims of the tsunami that struck with devastating force two years ago. The earthquake that rocked the northeast of Japan triggered a giant wave, killing thousands of people and causing the worst nuclear disaster since Chernobyl. The tremors damaged the nuclear power plant at Fukushima and eventually led to a meltdown in three of the plant's six reactors. The area around the facility is still contaminated and the pace of reconstruction is painfully slow. Japan and Germany as well initially reacted to the disaster by promising to phase out nuclear power completely over time. But a new Japanese government now wants to backtrack on that pledge. Even among environmentalists, a phase-out is divisive. The shortfall will have to be met by coal or gas-burning plants, and they produce large amounts of greenhouse gases. On the second anniversary of the Fukushima disaster, the debate it sparked about the future of energy supply rages on. Alexander, let's talk a little bit about these pictures we just saw there. I mean, there we see the emperor of, of Japan mourning the loss of thousands of people. And it happened just two years ago. And at the same time, we're reporting that basically nothing has changed in the country. Um, how do we explain that? Well, I think that it's not quite true that nothing has changed. If you look at Japan at the moment, you'll see that compared to pre-disaster Japan, there's a huge um, critical mass of people uh, among the population that are watching very carefully um, uh, what is happening in nuclear policy. So I think there is now um, a substantial difference to pre-disaster uh, Japan in the sense that we have a critical um, public well, that you, is watching. Yeah, I mean, you, you said we have a critical public, and that is true. The numbers certainly skyrocketed. The number of protesters skyrocketed after the accident. But um, in the in the news that construction is being resumed on a new reactor, there's been no public outcry at all. Um, things have been very quiet in Japan. Why, why do you think that is? Well, first of all, I think um, there's a clear sense in the public and also within the government that Japan cannot get away from uh, nuclear power very quickly. Uh, Pre-disaster, Japan was um, dependent on nuclear energy for about 30% of its total energy demand. And that's a huge amount of um, uh, that energy demand. And so I think there's a realization in the public that Japan needs time to adjust and that in the short term, at least, Japan needs to continue uh, nuclear power usage and, um, and only in the long run perhaps uh, Japan can get away from dependence. And is that what the public is thinking right now? Even the people who are vehemently against nuclear power, they're willing to stick with nuclear power until the year 2030 or 2040? Well, there's certainly a, um, a part of the population that is uh, absolutely opposed to getting any reactors uh, back online. But if you look at um, public opinion polls, you'll see that uh, about 70% of people are saying, yes, in the long term, we need to get away from uh, nuclear energy. But in the short term, we do agree that Japan needs uh, nuclear energy particularly um, because of uh, Japan's economic situation. Japan has been in the depression for about two decades and needs to get out of that. And uh, energy imports at the moment are very expensive. So um, I think there's a clear realization that nuclear power for the moment is a very cheap source of energy. It is a cheap source of energy. And I think too, maybe a lot of times um, the, the public um, discounts how important a nuclear reactor is to a community. I mean, if you, if you read the numbers of the tax revenue, for example, um, across Japan, you know, you have hundreds of, of small communities that live from the taxes that are paid by these reactors. Um, is there anything in place in Japan in terms of policy that could compensate for the loss of all that tax base if you were to shut down the entire nuclear power industry? Well, I think this is a major problem and a major hurdle, actually, for Japan to get away from this nuclear dependence. In fact, as you say, these uh, villages that have nuclear powers that, mm -hmm. that host these power plants 
um, they depend on, on these subsidies from the government and from the power companies. And uh, precisely because of that, um, they're not willing to go away from, from nuclear dependence. And I think this is, um, has not been solved yet in Japan, but it is a problem that needs to be uh, addressed. And I think as long as these communities uh, keep being dependent on these subsidies, it's going to be very difficult to, to uh, recreate uh, local uh, economies there. I know that when, um, when outsiders read numbers uh, about what the Japanese are thinking right now, they're, they're sometimes amazed. Um, the prime minister right now enjoy, enjoys an approval rating of 70%. And this is the same prime minister who is talking openly about sticking with nuclear power. Um, Germans, for example, you know, they are on a completely different page when it comes to this. And they, 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 they want to understand why the public is still in love with a prime minister who wants to keep going nuclear. Yeah, I think it's not the nuclear issue that makes him popular, but in fact, uh, if you look at the last election in December, uh, what got uh, Prime Minister Abe uh, elected was really the economic issues. That is mm -hmm. at the heart of, of the uh, Japanese public at the moment. Uh, like I said, uh, Japan has been in a depression and people are worried about their livelihoods, their work, uh, uh, having social benefits. So um, what they're most concerned about is having a political leader that uh, promises something new in that field of uh, is, expertise. Is, is there also a feeling in, in Japan, of, uh, what I've heard from a lot of people who have been reporting there is that the, the masses are so concerned about the, the integrity of the economy, they don't want to hear anything else coming from Fukushima. They want those people almost to be quarantined off because they're afraid that th that is a permanent liability for the entire country. Is there this sense, you know, please let's forget about that ugly chapter that happened two years ago? I think among uh, pro-nuclear uh, lobbyists uh, from, from the nuclear lobby, I think there's certainly a sense of let's forget about Fukushima, let's get back to business as usual. But I think uh, among the population there has been a clear change of mind and a different consciousness about the environmental issues connected to Fukushima and, and the tragic um, um, lives of, of those who live uh, near the, the Fukushima nuclear plant. So I think uh, within the public you'll find a lot of understanding for those people. Let me pull in Frauke and Maya on this too. Um, the Japanese are amazed that the Germans were able so quickly after Fukushima to, to make um, a decision that um, is talked about now around the world. Um, everywhere you go, when you're meeting with um, policymakers, they talk about the Germans' bold decision um, to, to get out of nuclear power. Um, but we hear all the time in Germany, and maybe this could explain what's going on in Japan, um, no one has the solution. No one has the answers um, of what to do when there's no more nuclear power. I mean, what do you, do you think the Japanese are looking at a Germany that made a, a decision too quickly? I mean, you know, you're talking about the, the economy here of Germany today, Frau. I mean, a lot of money is at stake, too. Yes, that's true. Although, well, first of all, I think German people and Japanese people have one thing in common. They're both very disciplined as a people. Um, German people don't like to go protesting very quickly, very easily. I think Japanese people are similar in that respect. And I don't think that the German people is actually um, unified in, in, in the opinion of having to get away from nuclear power so quickly. Um, when you say that Germany took this de decision very promptly, um, then it was basically our chancellor who sort of um, appointed, um, or he said that this decision was to be taken very quickly. Um, and if you look into um, a round of our politicians, you see that even they are not they don't really agree on what's going to be done first and how um, the so-called Energiewende is to yeah, be the, the change painful. in energy policy, yeah. It, it, yeah, it is painful. It is painful. And was it a decision here that was made too fast? And that's what the Japanese realize now, Maya? Would, would you agree with that? Well, I really appreciate for, for Germany to go, to, to, to go this step because I come from an area... Um, from the area of Gorleben, which is uh, which is known to be uh, in waste disposal for the nuclear, nuclear waste, waste. Story, and right. I think that's another issue which, which has not come up yet. That mm -hmm. is the, the point of nuclear waste, and we're very interested to interested to know how the Japanese deal with the nuclear waste because now that is something that nobody really knows how to deal with in the future. 
and, and that, that's a, that's a global problem too. That's not just something that, that the the Japanese have. But um, the Japanese, in their press, are always talking about um, how do you finance the end of nuclear and what replaces it, and they can't come up with answers. And that's the same thing here in Germany. And yet the Germans have taken that decision. Uh, maybe the Japanese are trying to learn from a German mistake now. I mean, what do you think, Alexander? Is that what? I think, I think they're very closely watching the uh, German example with, with interest and also the recent discussions that uh, the, this change in energy policy is going to, in fact, cost a lot more than uh, initially assumed in Germany. So I think they're watching this very closely. Um, so it, at least from the Japanese perspective, probably the Germans went much too quickly without considering all the, the effects of their decision. And, you know, you mind brought up the, the idea of, of nuclear waste. I mean, you've got a lot of contaminated trash now around Fukushima. Um, do the Japanese have a plan for collecting that and, and storing it? No, that's actually a huge problem with the, the cleanup that um, it, with each community, they have to find a different plan on, on how to dispose of this contaminated uh, waste. And in some com communities, um, the, this is holding up uh, cleaning up uh, efforts, in fact. Um, so um, whether it's with regards to nuclear waste in general or this particular um, nuclear waste from, from uh, decontamination efforts, Japan does not have a solution. Before we move on, I wanted to ask you this too. I mean, you know a lot about Japanese society. The Japanese are known for being very patient. Um, is, does that play a role here too, why we haven't seen a, a big decision for a, a drastic change in energy policy? I don't think it's it's necessarily patience, but I think um, there's really been, if you look at uh, traditional Japanese policy, I mean, there was a very strong belief in Japan pre-disaster that uh, nuclear energy is the, the, the way to go for Japan for a country that does not have resources. Mm -hmm. And so um, just the realization that, hey, we need to reconsider this um, nuclear energy, I think is already a huge change uh, in Japan. Definitely. All right, well, let's move on. We're going to go now from um, energy uh, to politics and money. Back in 1999, I interviewed the former German Chancellor Helmut Kohl. Now, I will never forget the pride that glowed in his eyes when he talked about the success of the euro. Now, it had just that year entered currency trading on global markets, which for him, it meant this was a real deal. Well, Mr. Kohl talked about how the currency was a symbol of the progress known as the European project. Well, 13 years later, and a lot of reality pills, the euro is for many people the symbol of what is wrong with Europe. Next month here in Germany, a campaign known as Alternative for Germany will officially go political. It plans to become a political party with the goal of undoing what it calls the euro mess. It's the issue that's dominated European politics for years now, the euro. The troubled currency has stumbled from crisis to crisis. And while Germany's mainstream parties have stood behind measures to back the euro, some of the country's top economists and academics tried to stop the bailout by legal means. In the summer of 2012, they sued to have the European stability mechanism declared unconstitutional in Germany's highest court. The attempt failed. Many of those same people are now launching a new party. The Eurosceptic Alternative for Deutschland will be campaigning in this autumn's elections with one specific goal. They say Germany needs to put an end to the euro. Well, Fraka, I'm glad you're here because, I mean, you are one of the founders of this new political party. Are you, first of all, are you going to get elected in September when national elections take place? Of course, we have to wait until the election, but we very much hope so, and we are confident that a wide part of German people will vote for us because we get hundreds and hundreds of emails every day from supporters that ask us where they can join the party and how quickly they, um, they can help us to build up structures to set up the party in all federal states in Germany. What is the promise that you are going to make to voters if they vote for you? We promised them um, to fight against the current state of the euro and possibly to get rid of it um, in one or the other way. Uh, so you're willing to keep it? No, we're not willing to keep it. We think that uh, the current euro as it is um, 
as in German say, dieser Euro, this Euro, yeah. cannot exist any longer because it basically um, tears Europe apart. All right, so, okay, so you're telling me then that you're promising people that you're going to, to get them out of the Eurozone. We promise them, if we get elected, that we will fight for political ways to end this Euro project, yes. Okay, but you're not talking about what's happening in just one country. And, and that's what's interesting here. I mean, you are conducting politics and policy that affects everyone in the Eurozone now. And you're saying you want to take the Eurozone's strongest member out of the currency union. Well, we, we say that we have to change this, curr this currency um, into a new structure, uh, in, if it's necessary to get out of this currency altogether, because as it is at the moment, the euro neither works politically nor it works economically. Okay, what, I mean, what are you having nightmares about, Frau? What is so bad about the eurozone? <laughs> the nightmare we have is that basically, not only in Germany, but in the whole of Europe, people basically are the losers in the whole game because money is taken from the states and transferred to the banks. I mean, I think the question you have to ask is who gets the money from all these bailout programs? It's not the Greek people, it's not the Italian people, it's the banks and um, the funds and banks that finance banks. Yeah, but can't we argue, um, I mean, we don't want to get you know, mired down in numbers here, but can't we argue that the financial crisis and the bailouts for the banks was a one-time event? I mean, the, you know, the finance minister of Germany, Mr. Schäuble, has said that one of the biggest conditions on bailout money is that this is a one-time, a one-off for you, you meet our requirements or we let you fail. I mean, those are clear words. But it is not, is it? I mean, it's, it's happened, it happened once with Greece and several times with all the bailout packages they got, or the Greek banks. Um, and it went on to, um, to Ireland, and it's going on to go to Portugal, to Cyprus, to Italy. It's not a one-off. Once you start a, um, the bailout programs, you cannot stop them. That's the problem with them. And they only, um, they bailout programs um, make evident um, what the whole problem of the euro is, that you sort of glue together countries that are um, not equally structured, that don't have the same potential, economic potential, um, and with the euro sort of used as a European glue, um, you take peop uh, countries such as Greece and Italy the chance to um, find their own way to develop their economy because they, ha they have not got the potential, they have not got well, the they right. Can't, they can't devalue their currency, but they can increase competitiveness in their countries. Why don't they do that and, you know, have to deal with the, you know, the problems in the meantime? But, you know, Germany did the same thing 10, 15 years ago, and now Germany is sitting fairly pretty. Yes, but if you look at, for example, Italy and, and Greece, then um, Economists say that you would have to devalue or take away 30% of, for example, wages in Italy and Greece, and that's politically not possible. Um, also, I have to stress again, the money that's um, put into these packages does not go to the countries. It doesn't stay there. I mean, if you look at these, was it 80, 80 billion euros that went um, to Ireland? The money didn't stay in Ireland. It was given from the um, European Central Bank to Ireland for them to give it to their um, bank for a bank and the money went on to all sorts of banks all over the world. But the, but the, but the Irish government had to give a guarantee for all that money. The, the, government, exactly. the, the government took the, Irish took the liability. Pay, pay, pay for, right. for, for this money. So that, that's not fair because in the end we, we don't rescue states, we rescue banks. And that's just not a fair thing to do. Okay, well, well let's say if, if, if we were to take banks off the table, would you then say that the Eurozone is something that can continue? to uh, exist and, and can be improved upon? Well, first of all, I think you have to disentangle the whole project in order for the, for the separate countries to sort of find their own way. And maybe in future there will be a new sort of common currency, whatever its name would be. In, 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 there are several models of economists. I'm not an economist, I'm a scientist, but I, well, from what I understood from the so economist... So is your chancellor. Um, yeah. Yes. So she's, she making, is, she's making decisions too, right? Well, she, about the, I, about the I reckon she's got lots of advisors, but the, the problem is that um, what 
besides the, the economic fact, German people were never asked whether they wanted to agree to all those packages. Mm, okay. German people were not asked whether they wanted the euro. Um, because I guess uh, in the 90s, even Chancellor Kohl knew that probably German people would never agree. And, and that's a, a severe lack of democracy in Germany. And that's another thing our party would is, like is to fight against. You want to fight, you want to fight against that. And let me ask everybody here. Are, are we hearing, is Frauke basically telling us that Europe has overstretched itself? That what Helmut Kohl, what people are trying to do with the Eurozone is just too much for a continent full of different countries? Is, is that what has happened? I, I think that um, actually people realize now that the burden is very big and that maybe uh, it's, 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 it's a big step to take. But I think uh, seen from the world and also seen from Africa, Europe is still a big example. And it would be, um, it would be a real big step backwards um, to show it didn't work out. I think it would be better to look forward and say, okay, how can we make it work? Yeah, what do you think, Alexander? Well, I'm not sure that the aspirations are too big, but I think the way they were implemented was certainly too rash. Uh, decisions taking very quickly without really ensuring that the countries that were joining the euro back, <coughs> back in the 90s were really ready for the euro. So I think this is a major problem. And what I'm missing in the current de debate is really is more transparency and, and clarity of, of what is happening, where the money is going, how things are being solved. Um, I think that is what the German public is really lacking. And do you think, I mean, I'll ask all three of you, do you think Germans should be given the chance to vote in a referendum of keeping the euro? I know, I know you Absolutely. do. And I, I, know, <laughs> yeah. I know you do. I find it quite difficult to ask a thing like that. Of course, Europe, Germans would have not gotten rid of the, the, the Deutsche Mark. Mm -hmm. uh, even me, I found it like really sad not to have it anymore, not to change the money when I go somewhere on a trip. But I found it nice to have a different currency in my hands. But um, I see it now. People learn from, from, from sometimes what, what they are given, and people tend to be conservative. Uh, so I think maybe it's, it's good to have um, people who are a bit more into the scene decide on that. And this isn't, isn't that the point? I mean, um, a referendum, you know, you're asking everyone to have a direct say in something that is complicated. I mean, economic policy, monetary policy is very complicated. Why would you put the decisions um, about that in the hands of people who don't know what they're voting about? Because you put the debts in the hands of the people as well. I mean, basically, um, let it... Uh, Irish, the Irish people, but also the German people, um, they have to pay for the debts. I mean, and, and they were never asked whether they wanted to do that. So um, we also say if the German people decide they want to go on with this project, then it, it should go on. But I mean, the, my opinion, our opinion as a new party is yes, they have to be asked. You know what, you know what the um, Southern Europeans are going to say, even, when, if, even if they agree with you that we need to get rid of the euro, they're going to say that the Germans are being very selfish. Nope. The, German economy, <laughs> the German economy has flourished while the rest of the world has been shrinking and been in recession. Now that the German economy starts to feel the reality of the, the cold outside, they want to jump ship and get out. But and this, save their, their economy. Yeah. I know it must look like this from, from the outside, but this is not quite true because um, we spoke early, earlier on about the Germans, how they, they cut back on wages um, about a decade ago when all the rest of Europe had really nice growth rates and the Germans didn't. And the, and the Germans were criticized I for mean, the, exact, with, uh, yeah, exactly. eternally um, for that. And if, if you look at wages today, they, ha they, haven't, um, they haven't gone up for, for quite a while. Yeah. And the actual um, buying power of Germans has gone back over the past 10 years. Right. At the same time, um, the salaries of the, of the managers have gone up by, I, I don't know the exact percentage, but I think since 1970, they have risen by 170% or yeah, something like it's that. A, it's a so big number. It's basically, yeah. money is going from one side to the other side. Um, that, that, that's the problem. That's why I keep... Um, saying you have to ask where does the money go and is it doesn't... Is a problem of the euro? Is it a problem of um, the I, 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 Of course it was also a problem of, of the euro um, because the, the companies we talk about are not the, the companies that employ let's say 50 or 80 or 100 people it's the multinational um, companies right. that um, act all over the world. Mm -hmm. You know, and also, um, this goes back to my question about who is going to vote for you. Um, the polls show that your party would actually pull people away from 
the, the conservative camp, um, the Christian Democrats, but also from the SPD, the Social Democrats. You might even get some people from the Free Democrats. And, I mean, forbid, you might even get people from the, le the left party. I mean, you, your party could be a catch-all. Um, but, but I'm wondering if that is a, a recipe for success or a recipe for nothing. I mean, are you going to be able to build with that? Because you mean a lot to, you know, to everybody. Yes. I mean, at the moment, we are a very, very young party. Um, when we concentrate on three main topics, one of them being the euro, but also general European policies, because for us, the euro problem um, represents one very, very big problem that is the lack of democracy altogether in the whole of Europe um, and also in Germany, of course. And yeah. so we also stress that um, we need more direct democracy um, because I'm very, very much um, confident that people do you think about their decisions? So I think that... Um, more direct democracy. Now you're sounding like the Pirates Party here um, in, no. in Germany. You more, know? Like, more like Swiss people. Like the Swiss people. Okay. Um, we're we're going to have to move on to the next topic. Before we move on, um, are you going to run for office with the party? If our members at our Bundesparteitag dis, um, wants me to do so, I would, yes. Okay. That is... Politicians speak for yes. You heard it right here, folks. All right, um, we're going to stay with politics, um, but on a different continent. Kenya has elected a new president. Uhuru Kenyatta received just over 50% of the vote last week, and the turnout was very impressive, very high, 86%. Mr. Kenyatta has pledged to work with his political opponents at home and to do it peacefully. But we're going to talk in just a moment on how hard that may be. But the new president has told the world beyond Kenya and Africa to take notice. In a pointed warning, he said that Kenya expects the international community to respect the sovereignty and democratic will of the people of Kenya. Who is he talking to? Is he flexing political muscle or trying to distract from serious problems at home, some of which he is accused of creating? The mood in Kenya is tense. More than a thousand people died in violence which followed the last disputed election in 2007. Defeated then, Uhuru Kenyatta has won the presidency by a narrow majority this time. But he also faces charges of orchestrating the 2007 murders and forced deportations and goes on trial at the International Court in The Hague in July. He says he wants to work for all Kenyans, whatever their political allegiance. I know that all candidates have made tremendous personal sacrifices for the progress of our country. And today, I welcome them to join us in moving our nation forward. Kenyatta's rival, Raila Odinga, is calling on his followers to remain calm and avoid violence, but he says he will also challenge the election result. I have a duty and responsibility to protect democracy in this country. There's anger here in western Kenya. The area is solidly behind Raila Odinga, and these people say the vote was doctored. Last weekend, it was Kenyatta's supporters who were celebrating loudly on the streets of Nairobi. Maya, let me ask you, I mean, what did you observe? Uh, you were there during the elections. I mean, were they fair and free? Was everything on the up and up? Well, of course, from what I saw, and I've also been with some of the observers coming from the European Union, from the African Union, um, you could see a very f a fair and free vote going on, people turning out in large numbers, as you said, and it was really amazing of how long people stood in the queues without food or they just bought a little can of water or something, which brought them through the whole day of waiting. So it was really amazing to see this move for democracy and also the, the peaceful way and the patient way people were waiting for, for the results to come out. And I could not see any, any kind of rigging going on. Of course, there are a lot of um, talk going Going on in Kenya right now yeah. of how maybe rigging took place one or the other way, yeah. um, but me personally, I saw a quite a quite a good contact uh, conduct uh, of the vote. What about uh, social unrest going further now? Because Odingo has said that he's going to challenge the, these election results. 
yeah, I think, but it's still staying really calm in Kenya. I mean, you haven't heard any news, and actually it should have been the top news that, that Kenya is peaceful, because everybody uh, seemed to be waiting for that. You had all the international media coming there and really finding, to, trying to find the spots where violence is breaking out, but it didn't. There were some uh, things occurred in the night to elections, uh, and you can't really shut your eyes on that. Mm -hmm. Actually, there, there were some, some, some attempts to, to get the voters away, but also the media, the civil society, they did a great attempt to, to really keep a peace and quiet in Kenya. Um, you know, I asked you earlier about the message that Kenya is sending out to the world um, with their new president. Um, uh, critics, uh, including the United States, including Great Britain, have um, accused the new president of, of West, of beating on the West, um, because that's, that's really popular in Kenya right now just to gain political support. Is that what was going on? Of course, it was part of, it was part of the campaign. And it was one of the reasons for Uhuru Kenyatta and, and William Ruto to get together. Mm -hmm. William Ruto is, uh, is also accused in Den Haag. He was uh, on, on the side of Odinga in the last election. So he's accused on, on the other side of, 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 the, um, of the violence to, against the, part, the, the people from But now they're both going to be there. defendants in this trial, Exactly. Right? So the problem is, though, that, the, uh, for example, the High Commissioner of, of Britain in Kenya, he, he said these things before the elections. And people uh, everywhere in the world, I think, they don't like to be lectured, and Kenyans as well. So they were saying uh, one of the phrases in the campaign was regain sovereignty. So they really didn't like that being 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 fuzzled into that politics. But, being but told do you, what to do you do. think do you think the UK was trying to influence the the outcome of the election by? You know, saying something. Well, I think I think nobody really likes to 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 make politics with someone who's who's indicted in Den Haag. So maybe that that well, there was a motive behind that. I I'm, I I haven't talked to to the British side, so I can't. Well, I mean, but it is. I mean, it, it is a valid issue for the international community. Um, it is not. Um, it's not easy knowing that the president of a state that you have relations with mm -hmm. is under indictment mm -hmm. for being involved in mass murder. In his own country. That's true. Um, and, and yet the Kenyans, I mean, I'm just asking what you saw there. Do the Kenyans then, do they just think none of this is true, that their president is not guilty of, of the crimes of, of orchestrating mass murder? I've been trying to understand that, and yeah. I've been asking Kenyans why do they actually vote for, for Kenyatta. And, and you could find people who are saying that they, they are absolutely innocent. All these riots, people who say that these riots, they came up spontaneously. And there's no, there was nobody behind that. Of course, you get the other side to say, like, um, I know very well that that has been planned and that there have been people behind it. It's up to the courts to find out and to find witnesses for, for either of the case. Um, and that's going to be very difficult in Den Haag to find witnesses to really stand up and... and, 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 and um, and, and, and to testify. Yeah, testify on that. Um, do you, do you think this case, I mean, what, I mean, what are the survival chances of this case then? Yeah, well, that's going to be a problem, though. We just had one of the four cases who were left in Den Haag, which has been dropped because one witness uh, withdrew and said he was lying. Other witnesses died. And also Fatou Bansouda uh, from, from Den Haag, she said that some of the witnesses are very scary um, to testify at all. So it uh, might just be that the case will be dropped. And, yeah, I mean, and, you know, practically all the cases at the International Criminal Court um, are directed at Africa. Um, are, are the Kenyans justified then in being skeptical? These Western institutions, the, the ICC, are they just, um, are they post-colonialism, colonialistic um, behavior, um, just in a, in a different wrapping? I mean, is that what is going on here? Is this the way the West still keeps its thumb on Africa? I think it's certainly an accusation that should be taken seriously and mm -hmm. should be uh, discussed in, in Germany, which is one of the biggest contributors um, to the budget for the International Criminal Court. Uh, Japan, by the way, is also one of the biggest contributors. So I think, um, I mean, the idea of the International Criminal Court is that it's universal and that it uh, takes a global stance, really. So if this, there is such an accusation that there is a bias towards uh, Africa, I think this should be taken seriously and discussed uh, in, in the countries that are contributing and also in the, the court itself. Fraka, what do you say about this? Are we looking, is Kenya a great example of how the West, um, through subtle means, still tries to influence and, and meddle in the, the inner workings of another country? 
Well, I, I don't hope so. To be honest, um, I think that for many Central Europeans, not necessarily for the UK, but for um, Europeans on the continent, Africa is so far away. Um, we don't really know very much about Kenya. We don't very know very much about South Africa, for example, let alone about all the other um, African countries. Um, and I have to admit that in the ICC, although it's, Den Haag is not very far away from Germany, I don't think that the German public even looks into that very much. Yeah. I mean, you, know, Maya, you were saying that the, the reporters were in Kenya and they were just waiting for the violence to break out. They were waiting for there to be bad news. Um, and obviously they didn't get those headlines. Uh, and there's not a lot of attention on the economic realities um, in Kenya. Kenya is really a hub in East Africa for, for doing business. I mean, I think that the president knows that um, he also has some economic leverage that he can work with now. And he can even fly to the West and say, if you want to talk to Africa, you're going to have to talk to me. Um, did, did you get that feeling th uh, that there's that type of confidence there? That's, of course there, there, yeah? of course there is. Kenyans know very well that their country is very important, in, 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 not only in East Africa, but the, for the whole of Africa, I think. It's a very technologically advanced country. I think if, if you look at the way how easily you can get access to the internet and, and, mm -hmm. and use the mobile phone to transfer money, for example, and it's all Kenyan solutions. It's, it's, right, it's their technology, yeah, right? Yeah, it's their technology, so Kenyans know about that, and they're quite confident about that. It's true. Um, um, I wanted to get back on, on the issue of um, of, of the good news and bad news. It's also, we had it only on the third topic today, Kenya and the story. So I really think it should be on the top news that we didn't have. Well, you uh, know, oh, you mean the top of the show. Well, you know what? <laughs> we, we, put it, we put it as the third topic because we said that the discussion would be easier by the time you reach the third topic because you have such a good report on the show, <laughs> right? You know, there's, there's always other ways of looking at, at the lineup. But do you think, in, in general, that, do you, I mean, I, you know, we, we, the media get beat up a lot on this show. People, you know, throw their daggers at me a lot on this show. Um, are the media partly responsible for the problems inside well, Kenya? Um, I think people, I heard a lot of people really boosting on the CNN or having yeah. some bad news, but yeah. um, yeah. also in, in Kenya, media took a great responsibility to have peaceful yeah. elections. All right, we're going to have to wrap it up. Um, ladies, thank you very much for coming on the show. That's going to wrap up the agenda this week. The time goes by fast. Don't forget that you can watch the show again online and write to us. Our inbox is always open. I'm Brent Goff in Berlin. Join me next time when I set the agenda.